talk about uh, the Drupal auto updates initiative um, sorry it's been a little while since I've you know actually spoken at a Drupal event so if I'm a little unpolished uh, please forgive me um, I'm Dave a uh, little little spiel here I'm the director of global product at DDEV um, so if you guys use DDEV local or have heard of DDEV live um, I'm, I'm making the product decisions over there I'm also a uh, Drupal.org security team member, so if you have ever seen a security advisory come out on a Wednesday, I may be involved in those to some shape or form as well. Um, I'm also, uh, I don't really have a title here, but I care about the auto updates initiative, and so I am an uh, initiative carer about her, as um, I guess the closest I could think of as a thing to talk about there. So um, what we're going to talk about today uh, is kind of just like a little update about you know the history of the Drupal project itself. Um, not super interesting, I don't think. Um, you maybe are familiar with it. Then we're going to talk about the uh, initiative, why it exists. Um, there may or may not be a live demo involved, um, and then some, I guess, call for action on your part. So we're talking about how you can get involved. Um, it's pretty easy, um, but I'll talk about that in a sec. So the first thing is, uh, let's, let's thank everyone who's involved in this project. Um, it's been a, a really, I guess a long time coming in the Drupal world, um, and it's kind of been difficult to get started. Um, so uh, the first person, I guess, person, organization is the European Commission. Uh, they funded some uh, development work for their Drupal 7 sites. And um, they basically have a fleet of sites um, and we're struggling to, I guess, um, manage these sites in a way that they felt was um, easy. And then they had some money and thought maybe we can help kind of the community at large to do updates um, better than we had been doing. Uh, they paid a decent amount of money basically for phase one. Uh, there's, a, there's plenty of phases here. And you'll, you'll hear that kind of regularly. So the phase one was funded by the EC um, to do auto updates in Drupal 7 and kind of Drupal 8. Um, and then the Drupal Association and several people here, um, Neil Drum, David Strauss, um, Lucas, Tim, I don't need to name the rest of them. I'm sure other people have forgotten here. But they're kind of the core-ish um, initiative team. So, the history here, um, I'm sure many of you have kind of run into this problem. Um, the Drupal security team uh, is primarily a US East Coast time zone oriented team. And so what this might mean for people who you know, don't live in that time zone, like myself, and probably like the majority of you guys, is that security releases get released in your evenings or in your mornings, or wherever in the world. And what this ultimately means is when a security release happens, you have to be awake for it or your site gets hacked. And in, in at least two cases, we've, uh, we have the security team have seen exploits um, happen within four hours of an exploit or a security announcement being released. Um, so, in, in that, and that's obviously like the Drupal Geddon kind of level of um, vulnerabilities that have been announced. So, 
what you guys have done, I guess, in the past is you're staying up late into the night. You have a large window of time where your developers have to be basically on call, kind of frantically refreshing Drupal.org for the security announcements to come out, um, which is not super sustainable, I guess, ultimately. Um, you know, you're paying decent engineers uh, time and a half or overtime for late night work. Um, it's it's not ideal for sites that are you know well maintained and have big teams behind them. Um, some other kind of uh, personas here in the, in this space too is like site owners um, may not really be paying for operations and maintenance on their sites, but they just had like a one time site delivery, and they don't understand why it's important to keep their site up to date, or, or maybe they understand but they don't have the technical capabilities to even update Drupal or do it themselves. Um, and then there's just kind of the pantheon of what other things people do in, in the larger communities. So like the WordPress community has had um, auto updates for quite some time and other closed source projects as well. Um, and we're just kind of living in worlds where people are kind of expecting updates to be delivered when they come automatically, kind of through magic. We'll talk a little bit about WordPress later. Um, so what are the solutions here? Uh, you guys, are, you've known them, um, you've probably done them. Have, have you guys ever had teams do any of these things? I assume maybe in the first to stay up and wait. You maybe have a hosting provider who does provide some sort of um, update solution. Uh, maybe that's Pantheon with their uh, upstream repositories, or maybe that's Acquia with, um, what is it, remote administration, or I'm sure platform has something, I'm just not sure what it is. Um, maybe you're doing something like on every Wednesday, you're um, running dress shop security only on the site you know, every five minutes. Or kind of the worst case scenario is you're doing nothing, um, which I think in, in reality is probably a lot of our target audience. Um, so the auto updates initiative, there's kind of there's kind of several personas on the, on this journey we're trying to solve for, but ultimately we're kind of there's a long tail of people who install a Drupal site. Um, maybe it's some sort of brochureware site, um, and they don't really. It just needs to be available, but they don't really care about it. They don't have a team, um, and those are the those are the kind of sites we're looking to solve a problem for ultimately. So. We want those sites, um, it's probably the majority of sites, to be secure um, and to do things like updates automatically, to do things like updates automatically in a way that is secure, uh, to do things automatically in a way that doesn't break people's sites, um, which is tricky, and then we reputationally take a hit for breaking people's sites when updates happen, and that I think is also um, for sure not ideal. And so let's um, talk about what auto updates is, are doing. So WordPress has had this feature in its core for years, and I'm going to take some opportunity to hate on WordPress a bit here. But um, WordPress's auto updates is um, not following a lot of best practices. I'll, I'll say that kind of lightly. Um, they're basically downloading a zip file from a server that uh, Advomatic or Automatic, sorry, um, controls and they're not doing signing along those lines, they're not doing um, any kind of verification that that binary hasn't been altered in any way um, and until, I mean my, my data might be a little out of date here but until somewhat recently, I think they were downloading that file over HTTP as well. Um, so the Drupal community, while this feature existed, it was always kind of a WordPress has it, it's a solvable problem, why doesn't Drupal have it? Um, so there's kind of a lot of things we have to worry about here. Um, so enter phase one, um, and this is, today has, has, has phase, excuse me, phase one has been completed. So there's kind of a, a rigmarole of stuff under the covers that we have not, um, I guess, ran into yet. But the things that we're supporting, um, I'll show you in a little bit of a live demo if it's um, going to cooperate with me. 
So things you might have seen, um, Drupal.org, um, there's a PSA feed. So uh, we have a module that you install. We can basically push things out into your Drupal site that's like heads up, there's gonna be a core release um, just for planning purposes uh, and it's coming. So you'll be able to see this on your status report dashboard and I think most of the majority of the admin pages inside of your Drupal installs. Um, the big thing in this phase one initiative was the signing infrastructure. Um, so this means basically uh, every file, every, I'm a little s sketchy on the details here, but every package that D.O. packages is cryptographically signed. Um, there is a whole signing ceremony. If, there, if you guys have ever wanted to watch a, a 45 minute video of like keys being passed around, there is a video on YouTube of a signing ceremony practice. Um, it was largely inspired by the signing ceremony that um, like the internet does when they rotate keys, which is like a four hour signing ceremony, which is kind of crazy. But basically getting um, keys in place to be able to sign code that is distributed from Drupal.org. Um, and so what that makes the auto updates and how it benefits the auto updates initiative really is you can be assured that the code running on D.O. that's packaged by D.O. is the code that is coming into your site. Um, and you can imagine why that's relatively important. Um, there's also some cool stuff I can show you too. There's some diff generation and uh, there's a, a basically a pack, packing method that um, you can do things like generate diffs from two versions of Drupal. Uh, so I'll show you this. Um, I ran this a couple days ago. I don't know if it's still a valid URL and I don't know how easily you guys can see that. Uh, let me make it bigger. So I'm gonna download a diff of Drupal 5 to Drupal 8.7.7. And Drupal.org will happily go and generate me the files to do that. And so you can see down here, it's downloading a 25, 26 meg uh, zip file of just the diff between those two versions of Drupal core. And it's quite big. But if we wanna go like edit the URL, what is the most recent version of Drupal 8.2.3? Anyone? 3. I don't think that will work. Uh, it's probably a good one. So I just want like a point release. Um, and this one will go generate, it generates a, a two kilobyte uh, diff. I'll show you that here, if I can drag it over. Oops. Where'd it go? Sorry. And you can see basically here's the core, um, here's the here's the the quasi patch version of like what we would be delivering into a site. Um, not particularly important. I just thought it was cool and to show you like the things that we were doing. Where's my slides? Yeah. So the other thing on the I guess. That's the infrastructure side of things, like the D.O., the Drupal Association having to build out um, the tooling for being able to do that. The, the module side of things, like the thing that will interface with your site, um, it's doing a couple things as well. So site readiness checks. Um, talk about this a little later. Um, so the phase one scope is limited to core, uh, doing updates and rollbacks, uh, no composer support. This is like the big takeaway. There's no composer support in phase one of auto updates. And I'll talk about that in a second too. And it's just core. So here's what the PSAs look like. Um, this is on a test site from a PSA that ships with the module itself. Uh, you can see on the, this is the status report page. There's a public service announcement that requires your attention. You know, basically go read this thing. And there's also, every subsequent admin page on the site will also have a, like a messages warning as well. Um, readiness checks. So this is like, is your site eligible to do auto updates? Um, and there's a bunch of stuff here. 
And I think you can also write your own readiness checks. So if you're, if you have like some steps that you need to take on your site, you can do a, your, your own custom readiness check um, and it'll pass or fail. So things like, uh, is your file system modified? Or like, uh, have you incorrectly patched core? Um, maybe someone went in and just like changed a file for you. Um, are you on a read-only file system? Because that basically prevents us from running new code on that file system. Uh, there's a couple PHP versions that Drupal will not run on um, in the 7.2 series for some reason. Um, I think a specific point really says, in fact, do you have enough disk space? Um, there's other things. I can show you the repo. Uh, they're pretty easily named. Um, you can go look at them yourself. And I, in fact, I encourage you to do that. So the signing and packaging infrastructure, uh, sorry, I cut off a little bit. If you've noticed on release pages on Drupal.org, um, you have the ability to see uh, SHA-256 checksums, um, but also down the bottom, if you want an MD5, you can get an MD5. If you want a SHA-1, you can get a SHA-1. And how many people, just show of hands, have like verified uh, checksum before? Okay, got some nods, good. Um, do you do that on every every time you download a file, or just like from time to time? Okay, cool. So every time Drupal, uh, the module goes, or the, the auto updates module goes and does this, it will verify a checksum, um, which is important from just like knowing that the binary or the tarball you're downloading is the tarball you're getting. Um, it's kind of a, an important check, and things like WordPress don't do this. They might today. I don't. I haven't, and say currents with the, the WordPress side of things yet. Okay, live demo time. Um, we're gonna hope this works. It should work though. And I have a backup video in case it does not work. Okay, so we've got a super high powered um, Drupal site. Uh, it's got all the bells and whistles clearly. Um, I will show you around this site, for instance. Um, what does it have? It has content types and blocks. Actually, it has no content types and blocks. It is um, as pretty generic as you can get, I guess. So one thing to notice here, you're seeing a PSA. Um, this is, again, test data. Do not be alarmed. I guess it's also in the past, so uh, no big deal. But this is what you would see if, if the Drupal security team, or I guess the Drupal association, or core team members will push um, an update out to your, uh, up to your like sites. Um, or actually, you're, I guess you're subscribing to it. So your customers themselves are not seeing this. Uh, didn't grab the URL, sorry. But your site administrators are definitely the people who are going to go see this PSA. And should, in fact, go read it. I guess that's an authorized. But you get the idea. It's pushing admins, PSAs to go basically like take action or prepare for action or what have you. Um, so that's the every admin page side of things. Uh, again, this was in the slides earlier. On the status report side, you also have the same PSA. And here's the live demo portion. This is Drupal 6. 7.68, and this also works equally well with Drupal 8. I just happen to have a Drupal 7 site. Um, <sighs> Cron has not run recently. Here's another example. Uh, the readiness check is failing, so I'm just going to go run Cron. This will clear it up um, just to make sure that like packaging has worked. So how do I run Cron in, in the UI? Perfect. Okay, so now I'll show you that, in fact, the readiness check has now passed. Potentially. Oh no, live demo is failing, guys. That's strange. We'll see if we can forge ahead with, uh, with that readiness check failing. So what what kind of auto updates looks like from a long-term um, 
standpoint is you're probably never going to do it this way. Um, there's a little phase one experimental area where I can go hit a button basically and click a link and trigger on an automatic update. But in the future, this will likely just be enabled and it will happen when the update happens and cron is running regularly. So today, for instance, this is an experimental module. You can for sure run it on your site if you want to, um, but we recommend you know, keeping a, a close eye on it as it's still kind of new. It doesn't have widespread adoption. Um, we'll talk about that in a second as well. So um, who wants to come up here and click a button? Nobody? Do you want to? Why not? All right, let's do it. <laughs> let's upgrade core. So I want you to just click my mouse. Oh. <laughs> Aggressively click. Just tap. How's that? That might be working. No. Does that mean? Cool. Update successful. <laughs> so to prove that this is not all snake oil, let's go through and just verify that we have indeed upgraded to the latest version of core. And I believe we have upgraded to the latest version of core. Cool, right? So live demo complete. Um, maybe worth mentioning, we do want you guys to install this in your sites today. Um, you do not have to run it in production, but we see no reason why you couldn't. There is a 1.0 release of the module, so it's covered under the security team uh, policies. Um, we kind of want people testing the corner cases here, because I'm sure there are a lot of them. Um, we've seen some stuff where sites don't update. Um, we just basically want more eyes on the code, more eyes on the process, so we can kind of iron, thing, iron these things out before the auto updates module itself rolls itself into core, which is hopefully soon. Let's move this. Okay, so what's phase two of the auto updates initiative look like? Um, we realize you guys probably are doing fewer and fewer um, untarring of tar ball balls and deploying them to servers these days. So phase one's maybe not super helpful to you. Uh, it's definitely kind of a building block for us. There's a lot of the infrastructure stuff. There's a lot of the um, assurance stuff that we need to, to hammer out a bit. But the reality of the auto updates initiatives is it's probably getting to be useful in phase two to you. There's a couple other hairy problems in phase two that uh, weren't in phase one. We've kind of deferred those for a while. So um, you guys have heard at least about the composer initiative in core. Yeah, see some nods, cool. Um, we needed that to happen for a couple reasons and we need some more work for a couple more reasons. Composer is um, kind of a hairy beast, uh, consuming uh, as much RAM as, you know, basically like one Google uh, Chrome window will for, you know, basically figuring out dependency trees and all that. Um, we want to do basically the, the work of auto-updating a composer-based install site inside of a web request. So what that means is there aren't 16 gigs of RAM available to calculate my dependency trees. Um, so we're trying to get some sort of, I'll call it lower memory consumption composer. Um, the, there's kind of this on two fronts. There's some tweaks in, uh, I forget the name of the composer package and I didn't write it down in my speaker notes, so forgive me there. But there's the um, composer tweaks for Drupal that help eliminate some of the dependency tree figuring out. Um, and that does help to remove a significant portion of the memory footprint there. But we're still talking about like two gigs to like 1.5 gigs. And, and no way is anyone giving that much memory to their Drupal sites, or hopefully not. So we have to figure out how to put a lower memory basically update of Drupal into the portion of your web request that hasn't been used by your site. 
Um, so what we're thinking about there is um, creating of a new, I guess, front end controller. Um, I use an analogy. Have you guys used Capistrano for deployments ever or have heard about Capistrano? All right, I see no one who knows what that is. <coughs> one person. Cool. Used it. So it's kind of a similar concept to Capistrano, and I realize that's meaningless to you guys almost. So what uh, Capistrano deployment is doing, and this is like how Cisco updates its firmware, this is how like Chrome OS does your <laughs> updates of your laptop and things like that. So what it's doing is saying like, I have one partition and I have another partition. And in, in Capistrano land, to kind of beat this analogy, um, you have a folder structure where you have your live site and you have the next site. And all you're doing is basically flipping a symlink in between those two sites. So your doc root is a symlink to one or the two of these options. And we'll be doing something very similar with a composer install where you have a your known good site like today. You'll have an updating site that's next to it that is using spare web requests to basically fill out this composer install. And then we'll send a request in the in the in the spare cycle to the other site to make sure that the site's like two hundred ing, so we're not flipping the switch to a broken site. And then the secondary site, I guess I could be writing this. Is this a whiteboard? Would that be helpful to visualize? Yeah? No? Okay. So, excuse my horrible handwriting. You have the live site. Oh, God. Can anyone see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you have a live site and you have an updating site. Oh my god. And so requests are coming into here, right? And in the spare cycles of your live site, you're sending basically like chunks of updates to the updating site. So when the update has gone through, can you guys see this again? When the update has come through, uh, we'll send like a web request here through like an update mechanism. So your customers will never get like a 500 site is horribly broken kind of message. And we'll verify that this is like good or it's bad. If it's bad, we won't do anything. We'll probably just delete it. If it's good, we will then point the traffic. So the AV controller here, oh my gosh. <laughs> Third one's a turn, let's see. Maybe shaking it helps. So there's the AV controller that is deciding where the traffic's going. So everything's going to the live site. The update's verified. This goes away. This comes to here. And now like your site's updated. And all the traffic's going to the new updated site. You know, it might trigger like an email like, hey, your site's been updated. Maybe go check it out. Um, and then if you know an admin comes through, you know, something's horribly wrong, uh, the person can go easily run a command to then switch it back. Do some DB rollbacks if necessary. Get on with life. But in theory, this should work. Um, and this is modeled through, like every firmware system does these kind of updates this way. And also, we can do contrib here too, because like all good Drupal developers in the Composer world, you're managing your Drupal contrib in your Composer files, right? Yes, good. Um, we also want to switch the signing infrastructure a little bit too. Um, and actually, kind of two broader community-based things here as well. We are working on the AV controller with the Typo3 community. And uh, recently, the Joomla community as well. So this may become the way relatively more and more open source CMS, PHP based projects are going to be using their sites or updating their sites. So there's kind of a broader community kumbaya thing happening here, I guess, too. And also, um, just like the signing infrastructure, um, it's a little complicated and anytime you talk about cryptography with people, you kind of get either excitement or, terif or like terrified response. So, 
We're switching to a little bit of a more understood update framework. Um, oops. I'll pull this up to just show you the. So it's called TUF. I don't know how you pronounce anything on the internet. TUF, I guess. And it's it's basically a Python project, but it's a you know a framework for securing software update systems, which is exactly what we're running here. It's got all the right buzzwords on the homepage, cloud native, um, if you guys know what that is, um, Linux Foundation sponsored, and we're probably going to implement, I think, the verification side of the update framework for Drupal's .org signing infrastructure, but this really doesn't matter ultimately, it's just a kind of coming soon. And so, um, how you can help. I kind of mentioned this already. You guys can run the auto update module. Um, go download it on drupal.org. It's uh, automatic underscore updates. It's for both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Give it a code review. Um, more eyes on it, the better. Uh, go install it. Go test it out. Go run the readiness checks. Um, give the team feedback. Um, you guys know how to follow uh, file an issue in issue queue. We're in a Slack channel. You can join us there and complain or loud, uh, give us praise, depending on your perspective, I guess. If you're interested in getting involved, um, kind of different vein, but this is more like you want to actually go write the code that does this. Um, our project page is here. We have hashtag auto updates in Slack. Pound auto updates in Slack. I don't know what your perspective is there. Um, we have regular initiative update meetings on the first Thursday of the month. I think the next one is the 2nd of April at 8 o'clock uh, UTC. And um, thank you. I, I realize this is a little short, so apologies there. But any questions? I'm happy to show you things more, please. Uh -huh. Sorry if I skipped, but what is about patches? One more time. What is about patches? So I have lots of patches, so on Drupal 4 or contrib modules, I'm not sure that uh, automatic updates will work with them. You have a lot of pages. Patches. Patches. Patches, got it, I'm sorry. As long as you're managing your patches in a predictable way, and for phase one, you're probably not super a super viable candidate. But if you're managing um, your patches through Composer with um, Cameron Egan's Composer patches plugin for Composer, you'll be okay. Um, anything you can do with Composer-backed tooling will be fine because ultimately we're just running like a Composer update in the updater process here. Thank you. Other questions? Go back to your, your, your phase one approach. Are there any considerations in terms of um, server permissions and file permissions? Yes, there are. So um, let me just pull up the repo. So here's the total sum of Drupal 8's readiness checks. So we've got, like, are, is the person who run the file, is the person who owns the file, can we, like, in an Nginx context, can we update the file, right? That's, that's in this file, basically getting the user, comparing it to who is running it, to who is owning it, and seeing if we can do that. So, so that's what we have to update users it. Yeah. So this will do like, I mean, it won't actually like change the ownership of the file, but it will check to see that the ownership is like, you're in the right group, you're in the right ownership, that kind of thing. The other file system related is, is the, is the file system read only. So we, if the file system's read only, we can't write to it, obviously. Um, so you, you can't really auto update your site if it's read only. Um, 
I don't think there's another one related to necessarily the file system itself besides disk space. Did you have a specific like? No, just my local user group, the, the guy that knows far more than I ever will, who's uh, uh, worried about this side of things and in terms of using right. So the, I won't say there isn't like inherent risk with having your entire file system or entire like web root be writable. And that's kind of like we don't want to accidentally turn Drupal into like a botnet um, just by you know executing arbitrary code in it and basically having you know everyone mining for like Bitcoin on your instances. Um, so there is some risk, but I will say if you have like an ops guy and you have like a big team, here, and here's where this gets a little sticky. If you have a professionally managed site and you're paying an operations and maintenance team to do operations and maintenance, auto updates might not be a great fit for you guys because you're, right, this, that's true. But you know, what it does do is you could say, okay, we know there's, here I think here's the perfect scenario. Your PSA announcing some Drupal vulnerability comes out a few days before we release the, vul the vulnerability fix. You then maybe put your site into read-write mode or something like that. You know, your file system admin goes and remounts the disk mounts to make the file system writable. Um, the auto update comes and happens. But your team doesn't have to stay up for like an eight-hour window and patching and now at two in the morning and everyone's super burnt out the next day. And then your team can just come in, verify that the patch worked, do the like git commit, go do a normal release and kind of the normal order of things. That's where I think auto updates will save the most time for teams that are are doing the like day-to-day -day professional management of a website. The the real real goal I think of the auto updates initiatives is for that long tail of people who just installed the site once 10 years ago and it runs Drupal 5 still and like how has it not been hacked yet? This brings me on to the second question. Yep. Uh, assuming you have module compatibility, would it work for major updates, 8 to 9 for example? <sighs> or is there a hope that one day? <laughs> I don't know that anyone's specifically given consideration for a major update. Um, because the I, audience you're thinking of would expect that, wouldn't they? Maybe, I don't know. Um, that's where, like, if you have that question, I would say come into the channel and ask, because to be fair, I think maybe someone's given it like, eh, that'd be an idea. But, I mean, you know, the eight to nine transition should be easier than like, any in the past, so in theory, sure, could we do it? Yeah, maybe, but there might just be like a, we're not going to do major versions as like a safety protection in the code for some sort of really big screw up. Thanks. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Yeah. The whole composer memory thing. I mean, you kind of skirted across that. Like, um, like, I'm so confused. Why does it need so much memory? Just so dependencies at that level. I mean, I, I maybe that's kind of the scope of this question. But like, I mean, when we have, we have an automated update server that we homegrown ourselves using yep. Composer, using scripts to, to we've got, I don't know, just about 100 sites. And so, yeah, with with that, we okay, pay to support it, but it makes sense to automate it. Right. right. Because otherwise, it's crazy. Um, but the composer thing is a massive pain. Yeah, so... Is that a blocker to... You, have, you kind of need a whole separate server to run a few updates on because of the amount of memories you need, and then what's... You There's kind of three spear points happening here. There's Composer 2, which may or may not be a dependency. I'm hope, hoping not, because I don't know how soon or late that is into coming. But there are memory... There's considerations for better memory management in Composer 2. There's the, what's the other thing? So I guess to back up and explain why this dependency tree um, thing is happening and is generating all the memory, like the more stuff you have installed in your Composer JSON, the more dependency graphing it's going to have to do. So there's 
like you have all right a module that has x y and z dependencies who have x y and z dependencies and there's a dependency tree calculation that's happening and it's kind of just inherently expensive okay. so one of the and one of the stupid things that happened when the composer initiative was uh, looking into things was they found Drupal dependency that I think had like 10 plus years of history and 10 plus years of releases. And what we, we emailed the person and said, hey, you have a lot of releases for like PHP versions that aren't supported anymore. Can you delete those for us? And that like dependency tree calculation saved like a gig of memory from us. So there's also some like spelunking we can do through release history to kind of make things a little tighter. Um, the other, the other, what was the other spearhead? I don't remember the third one, um, sorry. But then people also suggest that we can do things like uh, if you, you've used dependency tree, like if you've ever given a composer.json to a service before and it spit you out a lock file, um, that is another solution there, but uh, we don't necessarily imagine that it will be feasible for the Drupal.org infrastructure to basically calculate everyone's dependencies, and especially when there's a security update, um, calculating you know millions, tens of millions of websites' dependency trees in a timely manner and spitting out a lock file to those people might not necessarily solve the world's problems there either. Um, it's just kind of a hairy mess. Sure. I, I thought of another name was more relevant question. Um, so that's a bit, kind of a bit of the size of it. But the, when you're doing automatic updates and you're doing a through point and click and you're changing files in the file system, is there any consideration for them putting all of those changes in files and configurations into repository or some kind of like, you know, so automating that side of it? So I know on Pantheon, they can do automatic updates. Right. And then that goes into your Git repo, and you can then deploy that from your dev to page to live. Yep. Presumably using some of the things in the kind of single point. Is there anything, is that part of this consideration yet? There's been a little consideration to that because there are people who do provide services in that space, like Pantheon, like mm -hmm. Acquia platform, I'm sure. Amazie, I'm sure, does something there as well. Um, here's That's a good. That's potentially where it's valuable, right? It's right. Something good. Developer who's going point and click on the dev side, all oh, well, the updates are done great. Right. Now, yeah. I think there needs to be a little, probably, community participation from companies around like what they want there. Because yeah. um, I think, again, this is, this is like the long tail problem. We're trying to solve not for agencies who have, or companies who manage website deployments. We're trying to solve like not that my mom has a blog, but my mom's blog, and she doesn't know or understand or care about updates. Um, like the, the world of, I think the Squarespaces and the Wix that are kind of like, you don't, the version of the software that they're running on your site doesn't really matter. Um, and they're just shipping updates to you as they come. That's kind of where this is as well. Like, okay, I'm running Drupal 7, 6, Eight, and I upgraded to seven six nine, but like uh, I don't care about that as like a a business owner. Frankly, I care about my business and I care about my website being secure. But I don't care about like what is this a minor point release of this Drupal module or this core? Like it doesn't much matter to me. And that that's the 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 long tail is what we're solving for, not necessarily that. I guess that's also where the tension comes in around security though, right? Like if I'm a business and a small business that I just care about security, however I'm willing to let my website have right access to the file system and also do the updates, right. and oh, my password's actually not that strong, or somebody right. else, my employee, and then suddenly somebody gets access and then do whatever. Yeah, and so that, that's kind of the story. I think, I think there is, like I would welcome you to contribute that, like, okay, I need like post actions, for instance, mm -hmm. after my site updates, like yeah, yeah. it would be great if there was detection, the PHP was detecting like you're in a Git repository and maybe we like create a branch and can create a commit in that branch or something like that. Um, sounds like a great feature request. Yeah. This is, yeah, I mean, yeah, I 
continue to think about that? Because that's something that's on my mind, so I'm really interested in subjecting. Yeah, actually, um, I don't know if I can find this really quick. <laughs> The amount of automatic versus auto updates. Kind of frustrating. So uh, maybe it's on the initial page. So we have some personas someplace out uh, here. Okay, yeah. So these these really went, I could think, in deeply and like how we thought about this. I think the the majority of auto updates are trying to fill these two use cases. Probably even the third one. But really like as I said earlier to this gentleman here, like if you have a team who's doing O and M, like this is kind of of minimal value. Um, they beyond like your team doesn't have to stay up night on nights and every Wednesday when like a release is coming out. Like that's taxing. Take space on pictures. Covering that as well or not? Um, kind of not. So, but kind of not on purpose. And I'll, I'll preface that with we've kind of got a handshake agreement, and I feel like for the recording, uh, actually, it may kill me if I, I figured this, or say this wrong. But um, I think the process for core is in a security update context, there will not be a database update. <sighs> I think. So the need for doing like an updb as part of the like end process, we don't need to do it. Um, since maybe we're patching just the dependency, there's less cases where like we have to run SQL queries to fix a I don't think there's been I'd have to do some digging into this, but I don't think there's ever been a Drupal security issue that has required an, a database update. But again, going back to the target audience of the, you know, deploy and ignore, right. over the lifetime of a, a release, there'd be several. Right. Yeah, and I think they just won't be intended. And I think, well, there's, if you are, if you have a Drupal site, you can run the updates through the UI very easily. Um, similarly, like we could just call that same function and run the updates on the behalf of the user as well. Um, I think there's just a little more risk involved there. Um, obviously, updating table schemas a little easier to do now that it's a transaction inside of uh, Drupal 8. Drupal 7 is still kind of risky wild, wild west land. But, um, yeah, I, I like I hear what you're saying. Okay. Anyone else? Time is up. Um, yeah. Um, it seems like um, this is mostly about updating core. Is there any idea of in the future updating country models as well on display, or is it something that you find to stay away from? So that's definitely on the radar of phase two, because um, really composer. Like if you have a site and you're managing it with Composer, you're gonna be managing your core, your contrib modules with Composer as well. So that is solidly a phase two thing. And yeah, if there's a security update for a contrib module, the theory is that will also work too. Anything else? Go install the module on your sites. Please, give it a code review, help us out. Submit those feature requests. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everybody.